Well, this is Labor Day weekend, and we're going to take a break from our regular programming, as the TV people say. Um, rather than um, look at God's message to us in the book of Romans, I want to instead ask, uh, what do you value? A recent uh, poll or survey done by the Wall Street Journal and NBC News together asked a values set of questions. They had done the same survey 21 years ago, and they did it again this past month. And the good news is that Americans value hard work just as much as they valued it 21 years ago. At least that's what they say. Hard work is a high value. So on Labor Day, we can take comfort that Americans still believe in labor. So that's the good news. The bad news is that American values have changed very significantly in some other areas. On the matter of hard work, that is just about as high as ever, but it has gone down considerably in the areas of patriotism, belief in God, having children. If you just looked at the overall numbers, they slid, but it's especially noticeable the difference between generations or age groups in that survey. If you look at those who are over age 55, you'll find that 79% believe that patriotism is an important value. Those 18 to 38, only 42% believe that. So about half as many believe that patriotism or love for your country is an important value. Of those 55 and up, about 67% say that belief in God is important. 30% in the age 18 to 38 group say that belief in God is very important. Having children is important to 54% of those 55 and up, those who can't have them anymore. In the age group 18 to 38, those who are actually capable of having children, uh, only 32% think that having children is an important value. So, In three major measures done by a survey in which they asked identical questions, um, you you find that patriotism and belief in God and having children are valued by about half as many people in the age 18 to 38, the so-called millennials and Gen Xers, or, or I mean the Gen Zers, as those who are part of the older generation. Now, it's a common hobby of people who are older to bemoan how things are going to the dogs in the younger generation. But they really are going to the dogs, okay? If that survey is at all accurate, it does mean that those in the generation age 18 to 38 don't value belief in God, don't value their country very much, and don't value having children. The replacement rate for having children, uh, our country has sunk quite a ways below that, and the birth rate declines every year. If you don't value children, you're not going to have very many. So you you have these interesting, and if you're a Christian, um, pretty alarming uh, trends or differences in generations. There are also notable political differences in this survey. And I'm not fond of preaching partisan political sermons, but it's worth noting what the political differences are. You'll find um, that when you ask by a party, you'll find that the Democratic Party as a whole doesn't value patriotism very much, a little over 40%. Belief in God, less than 40%. Having children, this is overall, now not the different age groups, this is all of them um, lumped together. But the parties still agree overall that hard work and financial security matter quite a bit, and self-fulfillment is a big one, and uh, tolerance for others. Hey, I'm going to do my thing, I want to be fulfilled, I don't care, you know, you do your thing too. That's a really um, universal value. Um, Just uh, very recently, the Democratic National Committee uh, endorsed a resolution declaring that the religiously unaffiliated demographic represents the largest religious group within the Democratic Party, a thing that the party seems uh, quite proud of. It's the party of unlimited abortion 
It is the party that is heavily favored nowadays by unmarried people and, and much less so by married people. And so I don't um, like to launch partisan political speeches. I'm not that fond of the Republican uh, Party and what many of their people have done either, but they are not openly celebrating that we're the party of the non-religious. We're the party that um, stands against Israel. We're the party where one of the leading candidates took his honeymoon in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, the, the anti-Christian atheist uh, pastor murdering uh, Soviet Union. So that's the situation that we find ourselves in. And it's really not that helpful not to face facts. Uh, if you're part of that age 18 to 38 generation, you're not going to get a lot of social support for Christian faith or for a strong view of family and a desire to bring up children to know the Lord or um, love of country or any of that. Now, along with these kinds of things, you get certain results that are nearly inevitable. Uh, if you value labor and don't value much else except labor and self-fulfillment and making money, where do you end up? Well, Ecclesiastes says there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Now, in, this, in the recent poll, they also found that most Americans are pretty happy with their current financial situation. And they think that the country is actually doing pretty well financially. And a large majority are very angry about the country. Um, and it also was found that 30% um, of people in the 18 to 38 generation say they are always or almost always lonely. Lonely. So when labor remains of value, but not God, not family or children, not your community or your society or your country, this may be where we end up a little bit with a lot of very lonely, very down people. And to think about why, you know, why this is, what happened? We can say, well, maybe that generation is especially selfish beyond the level of previous generations. They're a bunch of ingrates. They don't value what God has given to them. They don't value that they're in a free country with many opportunities. They're not patriotic anymore. Um, their parents had them, and for some reason, they don't seem too interested in handing on any blessings or advantages to kids. So that's one possible answer. Another possible answer is, hey, maybe parents didn't do a very good job of transmitting the faith. Maybe parents didn't provide the kind of family environment where kids said, hey, we want to get married. We want to have kids because our experience of childhood wasn't very positive. Whatever the reason or reasons might be, it's a fact that we have a generational change. And I think it's important that we realize we do not live in a Joshua generation. A Joshua generation is a generation where a lot of people have said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We are in it for the Lord. We're totally dedicated to the Lord and we're supporting each other and we're marching together. After the Joshua generation, you read in Judges 2 verse 10, after that whole generation, had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And then the book ends by saying, in those days everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Last comment to the book of Judges. Now which generation do you think we're more a part of? A Joshua generation or a Judges generation? A generation where people have forgotten what the Lord did for their people, for their nation. Uh, a nation where everybody does what's right in his own eyes. I think it's almost beyond dispute that we live in a judge's generation and not in a Joshua generation. Or to put it in different terms, we do not live in a time of spiritual revival. 
We do not live in a time when the churches in large part are flaming with the life and power of the Holy Spirit, where they're making a huge impact on society, where communities and governments even are influenced powerfully by movement of the Spirit of God. We do not live in a time like that right now. I'm not saying it could never be such a time, but you're not going to have revival if you don't realize what you're lacking if you're not seeking and yearning for the power of the Holy Spirit to change things, to turn things around. And nothing less than that will turn things around. When you're in a judge's generation, you need a mighty movement of God or things get worse, not better. So I think it's just important that we face honestly where we're at. We're in a judge's generation. The Bible says there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, ungrateful, unholy, without natural affection, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. I'm not going to comment on that a lot. Just look at some of the phrases. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Um, You know, we value self-fulfillment and financial achievement very highly. A bit ungrateful, though. God isn't very important. The nation in which all of that happened isn't very important. Unholy, without natural affection. Um, that's without storge, without family affection. Just the normal affection that, uh, that parents would have for children or a desire to have children or the normal affection between a man and a woman. If there's one word that would describe increasingly our society, it would be abnormal. Just normal family affection, caring about having children and bringing them up, realizing that uh, natural affection is between a male and a female. If you're in a generation without natural affection, you should realize in one sense it's nothing new. It's just a reversion to the paganism that existed before Christianity swept a great portion of the world. It's a reversion to a people who were without natural affection. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, always studying, um, never actually clamping down on any truth that you can stake your lives on. And when you live in such a generation, you just have to ask um, the question Jesus asked. Jesus was pretty popular for a while. It really helped when he did that miracle of feeding the 5,000. There were a lot of people there listening to him. They were excited at the free food. In fact, they wanted to make him king. And Jesus gave a speech. And by the end of his speech, nearly everybody bailed out. He was not a good politician. They wanted to make him king, and just when they wanted to make him king, he said, well, I don't think you understand who I am. I'm the bread of life. You need to believe in me. Uh, And then he went on to explain who he is as the bread of life and the one we need to trust for eternal life and that we need to feed on him. And at that point, all of his so-called disciples bailed out except those who were closest to him. And Jesus says to them, you don't want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus asked a very penetrating question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And Jesus warns at that time, near the end, many will turn away from the faith. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you live in such a time, you must be one who stands firm. Stands firm to the end or you will not be saved. Because this is not a time where just people are being kind of swept along by the flow of revival or being swept into the kingdom because it is a a wonderful and lively and great and healthy spiritual time. When the love of most grows cold, 
You need to be somebody who is firm in love and committed in love, or you will not love. You will grow cold in your love for God, even in your love for other people. So when you're living in a time when many are turning away from the faith, don't put on the blinders and, pre and pretend you're not living in such a time. You are. And if all you do is go with the flow, you too will turn away from the faith. That's just the facts of the matter. And living in such a time, it, it's very striking that we live on an anniversary when we remember again that foes from without who were very powerful and a tremendous threat, but were defeated, seem to nonetheless have gotten their way. This year is the 75th anniversary of D-Day, when the power of Hitler and the Nazi fascist regime in Germany that had swept over much of Europe, when its power was broken, and Hitler hated the Ten Commandments. He hated Christianity, he, of course, famously hated Jewish people as well. And Hitler was a strong believer in eugenics, in the breeding of a great race and the eliminating of those who did not fit his vision of an evolutionary future. And he loved evolution. He loved selection of the superior races, which, of course, was the subtitle of Darwin's um, famous work on, the, on some races surpassing others. That's, that was the subtitle of uh, his work, The Origin of Man. At any rate, Hitler and his, uh, his henchmen said Nazism is applied biology. And so we might say to ourselves, well, what would have happened if Hitler had won? What if the Normandy invasion had failed? What then? Well, if Hitler had won, you know what? They would be teaching evolution in all the government schools. If Hitler had won, they would be eliminating all the little Down syndrome children before they could even be born. They would make sure that anybody who was detected with genetic disabilities was wiped out before they ever could grow up. If Hitler had won... They wouldn't have the Word of God or the Ten Commandments in public places or in the nation's education system. Wouldn't it be horrible if Hitler had won? Yeah. That's one anniversary. Another anniversary is that 30 years ago, back in 1989, Poland held their first free elections in many, many years after decades of communist, atheistic oppression. In that same year, the Berlin Wall that separated communist East Germany from West Germany was torn down. Communism collapsed. What if communism had won? What if the ideas of Karl Marx had prevailed? What if atheistic communism had won instead of lost 30 years ago? Well, you might have university professors of sociology for whom Marx was their favorite sociologist. Oopsie-daisy, um, that's what we've got. What if, you know, we, we can ask these what-ifs they had won, and then you think to yourself, but it seems like they did. Because, you see, the main threat was not simply what would happen if enemies from without prevailed, but what happens if there is a problem of inner decay, and you don't face it, and you don't recognize it? Back in 1933, while Hitler was on the rise, he had friends, and his program had supporters in the United States. There was a magazine run by a woman named Margaret Sanger, that published articles by Hitler's director of planned sterilization. Margaret Sanger's organization today is called Planned Parenthood. What if the communists had won the Cold War? Then our public institutions would be officially godless and um, 
the universities would be dominated by teaching on class warfare of the kind uh, taught and advocated by Karl Marx. Well, when a society has had a Christian or a godly heritage and it forsakes it, it becomes worse than it was before it was just pagan in the first place. Adolf Hitler was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Joseph Stalin, the Russian communist dictator who murdered millions of people, was educated in an Eastern Orthodox seminary. When people forsake something of the teaching of God and of the reality of God, they are worse than those who have never heard. And that's true of some of these monsters of history, but it's also true of societies and civilizations. When, when we become a judge's generation, you know, the, the Joshua generation won the big battles. There was a generation before us that won some really big battles against some really menacing enemies, and then the judge's generation just slides into something else. And again, we need to understand the kind of society and generation in which you live, or we cannot be realistic followers of Christ in the situation in which we find ourselves. So again, let me just ask, what do you value? You know what your fellow citizens increasingly value or don't value. What about you? Do you value God and eternal life in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life right now? Do you value family and children? Do you value your community and the country that God has placed you in? Because when you value those things, then when you value work, there's still some point to it. You're still working for somebody, and you're still um, working not just in God's power and for him, but you're working for your family, for your children. You're working to make your community and your country a better place. If you don't value those things, then you're like that guy in Ecclesiastes where you work and you work and you work, and then you say, um, what am I working for? Who am I working for? So on Labor Day, I'm asking you again to just ask, um, what do you value? The Bible says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. I'm being bugged by the Lord of the Flies, um, which is the name Beelzebub. Anyway, that fly can keep flying around and I'm going to keep preaching. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. So if you want a family that flourishes, it's not going to get built without the Lord. If you want a city or nation that flourishes, the watchmen can be doing their part, the soldiers can be very brave, but without the Lord, they're standing guard in vain. You can get up early and work late, and you can be as devoted to labor as anybody's ever been devoted to labor, and you might just miss out on a good night's sleep and find yourself very lonely at the end of it all. Unless the Lord, a lot of other things are in vain. And so when people fall into a situation in which they think belief in God and faith in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't matter, it's really not so much time to feel angry at them or threatened by them or just say, oh no, what's going to happen to us now that our society is headed in a certain direction? Um, feel some sorrow on their behalf, some grief for them, some compassion for them, because unless the Lord's involved, things are not going to be better in their lives. And when it comes to the question of having children, sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. This psalm, by the way, was written by the king who presided over the golden age of Israel, one of the only writings we have in the Psalms by King Solomon. And Solomon knew what makes a nation great. Um, he also knew what it's like to immerse yourself in anything you want. Um, and so he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes as well, in which he says, meaningless, meaningless, everything's meaningless if you're just living it under the sun 
and apart from God. So unless the Lord builds the house, it's in vain. It's vanity. It's meaningless. And with the Lord, you can appreciate your children and you can have the strength um, when you do face enemies. The psalm immediately saw, uh, following that in the collection of psalms is number 128. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in His ways. You'll eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. And may you live to see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So again, it's a, it's a psalm of faith in the living God. It's a psalm of delight in God's blessing of family and of children. It's a psalm of seeking the prosperity of Jerusalem and of Israel as a whole and of the people of God. And we have to be a little careful with the language of Israel because the United States is not the exact equivalent of Israel. It is not the chosen people of God on earth. The chosen people of God on earth are the international church of the Lord Jesus Christ all around the world. But nonetheless, when you're part of a nation that has been so favored in so many ways and has had a history of great awakenings and revivals and of, of people living for the Lord and was heavily influenced by the truth of Christianity, then to seek um, the prosperity and peace of that nation, in short, to be patriotic, is still uh, a good thing. If you are in a situation where, having looked at the flaws and problems of the nation that you're part of, and say, it's just like every other one, let me just ask this question. What do you know about every other one? Were you ever in the Soviet Union when they were nailing priests and pastors to church doors and pouring water on them in 30 below weather so they could die, where people were being tortured in the gulags? You really think that that nation is the moral equivalent of the one that you live in that gives freedom to preach the gospel and offers many opportunities? We live in a situation of tremendous blessing and privilege. There were unspeakable horrors committed throughout Europe by the Nazi and by the communist regimes. There are still terrible things being committed by the Chinese atheistic communist regime today. And to pretend that all nations are just the same and that you can just pick one or the other. It is not, of course, by simply the virtue of one country and all their goodness. But when the blessings of God have been bestowed on one and when many of the influences of the Christian faith have been brought to bear in its approach to life, then let's not be so dumb that we say, hey, if we just lose that, if, if we don't mind, um, you know, what do people know about socialism? You know, I don't want to get too political. All I know is that every nation on earth that has ever tried it has ended up bankrupt and viciously cruel to people of faith. That's what I know, but I've been around. I'm one of those old guys, <laughs> okay? I was around when the Berlin Wall fell. I was around when pastors were getting murdered and reading about it and hearing about it. And so I'm just going to urge and say, hey, if you've been blessed to live um, in a country that gives you opportunities to worship the Lord freely and to spread your faith, and to live as God calls you, um, then don't take it for granted. And certainly do not take uh, a godly family heritage for granted or take God himself for granted or as something that he's just kind of an option. Um, God, belief in God doesn't matter anymore. And even if you're living in a country that is not so good. If you were living in one of those bad countries, hey, we've seen already what the Apostle Paul said, living under Caligula and Nero, you still pray for your country. You still want the well-being of the society that you're in, even if it's in a bad situation. 
Jeremiah was writing under the occupation of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and under a very evil king in many respects. And he said, seek the peace and prosperity of the city. This is what God said, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. That is Babylon. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you'll prosper. So even if you're living in a bad country, be praying for that country. Even if you have kings that aren't so hot or rulers, pray for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Something's gone really far south if you don't care about the country that you live in anymore and aren't speaking to God about it and, and praying for it. That doesn't mean that you're just a gung-ho, flag-waver, my country right or wrong all the time, but to truly love the nation of which you're a part and to seek its well-being and to pray for wisdom for its rulers is absolutely vital for us who truly want to follow God and serve Him. So let me just ask again, what do you value? Just think about it. This isn't a very complicated sermon. Do you treasure the fact that God called you to be His own? That He sent His one and only Son into the world that you might live through Him? That He poured out His precious blood that your sins might be forgiven? That He gives you the supreme gift of eternal life with Him forever? Isn't that worth valuing? Do you value family, the family that God gave you to grow up in with all of its faults? You're here because of that family, even with all of its faults and failings. And where it, where it failed, are you just going to say, hey, kids don't matter? Or are you going to say, I want to bless a new generation, and maybe, as the Bible says, in some cases, be delivered from the empty way of life handed down to me from my forefathers, but at least they gave me life, um, and so I want to give life and a better life to the next generation. Do you value the, the area in which you live, your own community, your neighbors, the towns and villages that we're part of, and the nation that we're part of? Don't just value self-fulfillment. What did Jesus say? He says, if you seek self-fulfillment, if you seek your own life, you lose it. If you seek Christ, then you get your own life. If you want a fulfillment, fulfillment is one of those things you can't get directly. If you're chasing fulfillment, you'll never get it. If you're chasing God, if you are chasing blessing your family and the next generation, if you're chasing trying to make your country a better place, you know what? You might just get some self-fulfillment out of the deal too because you gain your life when you're not thinking only about number one and then you're working with a purpose. Then you're not doing that kind of work described in Ecclesiastes as vanity of vanities. Hey, the Bible has nothing good to say about lazy bones, nothing good to say about the sluggard. So it's a good thing on Labor Day to value work, but work for what? Jesus says, don't work for the food that spoils, but for food that lasts to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. We ask, dear Lord, that you will help us in our own time to understand the times in which we live, to not simply bemoan some of the trends that may trouble us though we do grieve over them, but, Lord, to commit ourselves afresh to you. To know, Lord, that when you come, we want you to find faith on the earth and find faith in us. That when the love of others grows cold, our love may grow warmer and warmer towards you and towards others, that we may be a beacon of light and love in a world which is sliding away from real love. We pray, Father, that we may not be so focused on challenges and enemies without that we forget the enemy that's always seeking to poison and corrupt within. And so, Lord, help us as individuals, as a church, as a community, as a nation, to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways, and for you to heal our land. Lord, give us your mercy and grace. Help us, Lord, in this time to become agents of revival, to be people who are constant and mighty in prayer, who are eager 
and energetic in our witness and are eager to endure all the way to the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.